So first of all, what is complex fashion, right? Some people may, does anyone know what complex fashion is? How familiar are you guys with the complex fashion? You can either talk out loud or put in the chat. Using complex numbers on geometry problems. That's exactly right. So you have a geometry problem, right? Let's say you have a triangle, it's like that. And you have a circle. And you want to prove that, let's say, the ortho center right here is drawn to be perpendicular, like this. You're going to take this ortho center H, reflect it over this point, to some point here. You want to prove this size in the circle, right? So obviously, you could do something where you have, um, uh, you do some angle chase, right? And you can say, Okay, because this angle equals this angle, it's thicker. But you can also use complex numbers to prove this, and we'll get into how. But the idea is that you're turning geometry into algebra. And this is key for a lot of problems because geometry can be hard sometimes, right? There's a lot of theorems that you have to learn if you're trying to do everything synthetically. Whereas algebra, it's, you have a few equations, you're just trying to solve them much simpler but even though i'm saying it's much simpler there's still a lot of things that you have to keep in mind give me one second no we don't have to do so what do you need to complex that well that's a good question first of all you need to identify whether you can complex that the problem some problems are just plain not complex fashion. For example, if you have a problem that says um, you have n circles, right? And they don't tell you how much n is, you can't complex fashion this problem because there's nothing for you to throw on a coordinate plane. You have to find a way to somehow make this into a geometry problem. For a lot of problems that are towards combi geo, it's going to be hard complex fashion. These you cannot complex fashion. At all. Now there are other problems that are going to be easy to complex fashion, and there are problems that are going to be hard to complex fashion, right? And that's the goal of this class, to show you how to complex fashion some problems and figuring out when a complex fashion is going to be easy and when it's going to be harder. Right? Let's go ahead. So Let's get started. So if you look at uh, the handout, there are a lot of formulas, right? So let's just go, I'm just gonna go over like the most important ones that I think are very important. So real numbers or a complex number is something of the form A plus B I, right? This is how we represent a complex number. It's conjugate is A minus B I. One of these two equals, these two are equals if b equals zero, or if z is a real number. Now, this comes in handy a lot. Why? Because it turns out that we need stuff to be a real number a lot of times. And we can, we can easily calculate z and z bar. So if we can say these two are equal, then z has to be a real number. How is this going to be useful? Angles, right? Let's say I have a, b, c here. And an angle like this, D E F. So if I was doing like regular synthetic geometry, I might have to angle chase to show that this angle equals this angle here. But in complex numbers, angles are equal if this number is real, if and only if this number is real. C minus B over B minus A over F minus E over E minus C. So if this number is real, then this number. Uh, the, these two angles are going to be equal. You might ask why? Well, let me give a small, small explanation. So, so shouldn't it be C minus B upon A minus B? 
here's the thing. It doesn't matter because when you multiply by a real number, it's still a real number, right? So if it's A minus B, it's just times negative one. Here's also times negative one. So it doesn't matter. All right, I see. Does that make sense? Yeah. So this is the power of complex numbers. You can switch the order sometimes and it won't matter because everything, as long as it's real, you're good. So as long as you can make sure this is equal to the conjugate of the expression, which is conjugate C minus B, C minus A over F minus C over E minus C, you're good. If you, now, if for some reason you're off by a sign, it could mean other things. We'll go ahead and explain some of those in a second. Does this make sense to everyone? Are there any questions so far? Yeah, All right, so I'm going, to, I'm going to go over the most important criterion, uh, collinearity. So although I say this is very important, it actually doesn't get used too much out, like outside of, well, it gets used some, but there's a better formula if you're working with nice points. I'll define nice in a second. But, Let's see. Collinearity is C minus B over C minus A is a real number. All right. Consequently, T. There we go. This is so you have a cyclic quadrilateral, and this is true if and only if. A minus B over A minus C over D minus B over D minus C is a real number. And this is equivalent to, if you look at our angle criteria, angle A or BAC equals angle BDC. Where angles are directed. In complex numbers, all angles are always directed. So if you're trying to prove two angles are equal, Make sure they're directed the same way. Otherwise, things will not work out. Very important to remember. Uh, what else is important? Reflections are important. So the general formula for a reflection is not very nice. Uh, the formula comes out to be reflection of Z over AB is Z prime equals A minus B times B bar plus A bar B minus A B bar over A bar minus B bar. Now this looks ugly, but if A and B satisfy like this, magnitude one. What is special when we have magnitude one? Well, it's oh, A conjugate is just one by A. Correct. A conjugate is one by A. And if you apply this to the formula, it becomes A plus B minus AB conjugate B. So this is a very simple formula and it can be used very often. Why do I say this? Well, let's go back to collinearity, right? If a point is on a line, right? Let's say you have AB, and you're going to choose a point Z on this line. If you put Z over this line, it should still be the same point. So if A and B satisfy magnitude A equals magnitude of B equals one, you can write, you can write this as, C is equal to A plus B minus A, B, C bar. Wherever C is, C can be anywhere on the complex plane. But this equation holds, which is pretty nice. Much simpler than doing this and taking conjugate. So this is what I said, collinearity, if you have nice points, which are points in the unit circle, you have this thing with no fractions, just one conjugate, really simple piece. And the last thing I want to talk about is the intersection of lines. So intersection of lines, there's a general formula. If you want, you can check Edmo or uh, Evan's handout. But the simple formula is for when A, B, C, and D all lie on the unit circle. And in this case, you get that the intersection of A, B, cap C, D is equal to A, B times C plus C minus C, D times A plus B over A, B minus C, D. So yes, this is uglier than most of our other equations, but it's still fairly nice because it's not too many terms. And you'll see what, what, why it's nice once we get to examples. Like 
it is definitely the ugliest form right here. But most of the time, you can either find a nice way to represent it, or it factors out really nicely. So now, these are almost all the most useful formulas. Like you'll use almost all of these in every single problem. There are other formulas you can find out there. You won't use them on every problem. Sure, you might have to find the intersection of tangents for one problem or two problems, but not for every problem. Same thing with like, let's say, uh, perpendicularity or triangle centers. I mean, uh, triangle can you move to the previous slide? Yeah, go ahead. Oh, uh, so how, how do you remember all of these? Yeah. So that's a good question. So what I like to do is I like to remember the proof of most of these and rederive them. So let me explain the, some of them. So the angle condition, right? ABC and DEF. If you, how can you tell these two angles are equal? This is actually a really good question I did not think about. Well, let's try to make sure that we don't know how to deal with stuff that's like off in like a random place in the complex plane. Let's try to make everything somehow related to the origin, right? So we can subtract B from all of these points and E from all of these points. So A minus B, B minus B, which is zero, and C minus B. E minus E, which is zero, F minus E, and D minus E. Now, it's still hard to think of, right? Because it's a random angle, like if I draw the complex plane like this, this could be a random angle that looks like this. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna rotate. How do I rotate? We can divide by C minus C. So that said, this to equal one. So now this gets transformed into the real axis here. So this line becomes the real axis here. And this line becomes some random line here. And now we can see that if, if you have two angles that are equal and you transform them in this way, then they have to, the second line has to overlap, right? It's impossible if the second line does not overlap. So when you divide by C minus B, and you divide by F minus E, these two lines have to overlap which means that one is just a scaling by a real number of the other, which is why you need this quotient to be a real number. Does that make sense? That's a quick way you derive um, the angle condition that will to give you cyclicity and collinearity. Reflection, there's actually a very simple proof. Um, I'm gonna ask you to refer to angle for that because it's a bit, it's like, Actually, I can show it probably. So reflection is actually the exact same thing. You have a point A, you have a point B, and you have this point D. Now you want to reflect, but reflecting over a random line is going to be hard. So you're going to try to reflect over the real axis, right? Everyone knows how to reflect over the real axis. So that's, that's what we're going to try to do. So it's the conjugate, sure gonna... right? Yeah. So we're just going to take everything to zero. Sorry, not minus B, minus A. Same trick. Take everything to uh, zero for the origin. And then we're going to divide by B minus A to get um, the real axis, right? So now we have Z minus A over B minus A. The figure looks like this now. You have, this is a new value of A, which is zero. This is a new value of B, which is one, like this. This is your line AB. And this is your point Z here. So you're going to reflect this to a point Z prime down here. And you get Z prime is equal to Z minus A over B minus A. And you're going to conjugate the entire thing. Like this. And now you have to take it back. So you have to undo the transformation. So what do we do first? Or what do we do last? We divide by B minus A. We're going to multiply by B minus A. And then we're going to add A. And when you expand this, that's when you're going to get whatever complicated formula we had over here. Uh, you're going to get this complicated formula up here. And if you plug stuff in, you get this nice formula. By the way, this nice formula down there is pretty nice. You can pretty easily remember. Um, and for the last one, which is intersection of lines, I personally just always rewrite it because it's much easier that way. So as I said, if points are on the unit circle, you have the very nice condition um, A plus B is equal to a, B, Z bar plus C. 
and c plus d equals c d z bar plus d. So you can just subtract these two. You can find what z bar is and you can find what z is. Does that make sense? Yeah. Also, something to note that might come important is z bar is actually nicer in terms of uh, intersection of lines than z if numbers line the unit circle. In particular, z bar is like a plus b minus c minus d over a b minus c d. So I'm foreshadowing a bit, but we'll see actually a problem in which it's nicer to use z bar because this thing is degree one, right? There's you're not multiplying anything. Well, the formula for z is of degree three. So this is more complicated. All right. So now let's talk about tricks because anyone can say, okay, I'm going to assign this random point a complex number A, B, C, and I can try bashing. But things are not going to work out very nicely, as you'll realize. So what are common tips and tricks? So the first thing is there are two very nice uh, figures in complex numbers. The first is the real axis, right? We already saw someone who was deriving these proofs, right? If you have the real axis, figure out if a point lies on that is really easy. Figuring out reflections is easy. A lot of things happen when you have uh, the real axis. The second thing that's nice is the unit circle. We already said when things have magnitude one, conjugate z is equal to one over z here, conjugate z equals z. So these very nice algebraic relationships makes our computations much simpler. And this is why we use them. So in a problem, it boils down to can you choose a good value for one of these two? Also, a third honorary thing that I should include is the origin. Because when you have a zero, if you can set a point to zero, almost every equation becomes very, very simple, right? So that's what we're going to try to do. We're just going to try to make sure, if we can, just make something zero. And hopefully, it works out. So a lot of problems in triangle geometry have triangles in them, right? So it's very common to set this circle, the circumcircle, to be the unit circle. Why? Well, if you look at the formula for triangle centers, you can see that a lot of triangle centers are pretty well defined. The circumcenter, the orthocenter, the centroid, uh, the incenter, x center. If you want, you can find this the median point. Um, almost all the centers are pretty well defined and are rederivable. For example, one of the most important things to know, just off the top of your head, is that the orthocenter H is equal to A plus B plus C. If you want, you can obviously derive it using, um, you can find the perpendicular point here, and you can do that, but just take my word for it, or the center is a sum. And this can also be done by vectors. So if you have vectors of a triangle A, B, and C, the orthocenter happens to be like um, A plus B plus C minus like 3, O, or something like this in vectors. I forget the exact value, but something approximately this. When the order center, uh, what, sorry, when the uh, circum center is zero, then the order center is just a plus b plus c. It's minus two o, I think. Alternatively, you can derive this because um, g h or g o equals one third g h, or sorry, o h, right? Because of the Euler line. You can derive this because the a centroid is just the average of the vertices. Um, in center does happen to be a bit harder. You have to, the issue with the in center, if you're just using A, B, and C, is that the arc midpoint happens to be root B, C. Both of these happen to be root B, C. One of them is positive and one of them is negative. However, you can't really say that a complex number is positive or negative. That just is not possible to do. So we have to assign them a square, b square, c square, such that, and this is important, you need this point here. Oops, now let me erase some that thing. You need this point to be, um, was it negative bc, I think? And you need this top point to be positive bc. Then you can say the in center is 
minus AB minus BC minus CA. This is the inference. Uh, why can't Very the lower point be plus BC? If it's plus BC, then you just switch the signs, right? So this comes plus AB plus BC plus CA. This is I just see. convention. It doesn't matter which one you use in reality. It's just that I like to use minus BC as my convention because that's how I learned it. So if you're ever using like formulas or anything, that's what happens. Um, actually, can it be my plus BC or anything? No, it cannot be plus BC. Why? Um, it's a, it's a weird thing, but if this is plus BC, right? So if this is minus BC, I can tell you it works. If this is plus BC, um, one of these three, right? If you have, not all of these can be plus. All of them can be minus, but if you flip the sign of two of them, you can't flip the sign of the third. So if this is plus BC plus AB, this is still minus CA, if that makes sense. It's a bit complicated, I think. Oh, uh, why so? Why, why so? Good question. So what happens is, let's say you have this, this setup works. We know this works. Um, so let's say you have this setup. Now you want to switch to plus BC, right? So you're going to have to either make B negative or C negative, right? Because you need the squares to be the same. So if you make, let's say, B negative, so then this becomes a plus BC. This becomes a plus AB automatically. So you can't change the sign of A or C. So this number still stays the same as minus CA. Does that make sense? Yeah. As to why so, Evan actually wrote a blog post about this. Um, give me a second, let me find this. Nope, revisiting argument points. This is actually pretty uh, important because argument points are not easy to deal with because of this sign issue that you get. So this is something really important that Evan talks about. I suggest you read it. It's very important. All right. So these three here that I discussed, these three points are what you need to set up a batch. You need the real axis, you need the unit circle, and you need the origin. Well, you don't need all of them, but you need a lot of them. A lot of them make things really easy. We'll also see a few more tricks that you can use. Once again, these are all tricks that make it easy. Obviously, you can solve a problem no matter where you put the triangle. It's just that sometimes your algebra will be really, really hard to use, and sometimes it'll be really easy. Now, the next step is how do you execute a bash, right? And this does not get talked about enough. Like setting up a bash is talked about a lot, right? You want to make sure you have a unit circle, you have, and yes, it's important because it's almost all the problem. Also, I will say this synthetic observation. So if you know something is true synthetically, use it, right? It can help a lot. Like if you know two triangles have to be similar, it might make the computation for one of the points a bit shorter, make it a bit neater, and less chance of messing up. Uh, if you know synthetic, don't be afraid to use it. And similarly, if you have like most of a synthetic proof and you need to prove one small lemma, but you don't know how to prove it, feel free to use complex numbers. They're sort of interchangeable. So when you're executing a bash, the first thing I'd like to talk about is organization. So you want to be organized, your scratch paper should be readable. Basically, what Evan and a lot of people will say, including me, is don't use scratch paper, use your actual paper as your scratch paper. That means write all your formulas, let's say this is your paper, right? Your official paper, you write all your formulas down on this paper and you can add text or commentary later if you need, but write everything down on here. That way, people can see what you're doing, the graders can follow along. And how much should you improve? Well, my, my rule of thumb is if the graders can't figure out in 15 seconds how you simplify something, it's not good enough, right? So if you go from this huge, huge expression to like one term in one line, it's going to be hard for the graders. But if you show things canceling out, it's much easier. Um, now, what's the other next trick? Factorization. So keep everything factored, right? And look for things that can be factored. So why do we keep things factored? It's smaller and it's easier to think about. Also, if you look at a lot of our formulas back here, right? Uh, where are they? Here we go. A lot of our formulas involve division, right? 
And if you have stuff that's faster, things can cancel out pretty nice, right? Like in any of these formulas. So factoring never hurts. Like if you need to expand, you can always expand back again. But if you have something that's expanded and you need to factor it, it's not always trivial to do so. So what can we do? Well, let me just go over the next trick, which is self-conjugating expressions. And this one does not get talked about. You will hear people talk, tell you about organization and factorization, but this is a trick that helps you, or I think helps make a combo slash much easier to do. So you're looking for things that conjugate to roughly themselves, right? So self-conjugation is a fancy way of saying, is this a real number? And sometimes you happen to get um, you happen to get an expression that will very easily self-conjugate. For example, a minus b over a minus c times c over b, assuming a equals b equals c equals 1. The conjugate of this is, let's work through this, 1 minus a over 1 minus b, 1 minus 1 over a minus 1 over c, times 1 over c over 1 over b. And if you simplify this, you get the exact same thing. So it turns out that these two happen to have the exact same, or have, this happens to be a real number. What real number this is, I don't know, but it's a real number. So this is pretty useful. If you see something that conjugates to self, it's useful. But you won't see this a lot. What happens is you see things that almost conjugate to each other. For example, what happens if I take just a minus b over a minus c, right? This happens to conjugate into uh, b over c times a minus b over a minus c. Oh, right? by the way, the expression you wrote is not self conjugate, right? Is it? Um, uh, c, c by b goes to b by c, not c by b itself. C by b. Oh, goes oh wait, to... no. Okay. Oh no, you're right. This is not self conjugating. This conjugates to something else. Yeah. Don't worry. This is a bad example. I think um, we should take C square by B square, then it probably will. Yeah, something like, something like that. Yeah, C square by B square makes sense. Or no, it doesn't. It's it's something else. This this example is a bad example. Uh on Mark and Red. It's, you're right, this example doesn't work exactly. But um the idea is still there, right? If something is its own conjugate, it's really nice because it's the real number. But here's another thing. This expression, this is what I'm trying to talk about, is things that almost conjugate. It almost conjugates to itself, right? It's itself times the small factor of b over c. And you'll see this a lot, right? A lot of things will almost conjugate to itself with some factors. So you only have to worry about the factors. What does that mean? Well, let's say you're trying to prove that z is equal to z bar, right? And in z, you have something like a minus b over a minus c. Now, you could either try to expand and show everything is conjugate, or what you can do is you can say a minus b times something is equal to, well, we know the conjugate is b over c times a minus b over a minus c times something else, right? So you can cancel these out, and all you care about is this b over c here. So that's all that matters. So if you have like a bunch of expressions that almost conjugate to itself, right? Like if you have um, a squared b minus a b squared, the conjugate of this happens to be what? Like a squared b minus a b squared over a cube b cube, right? This almost conjugates to itself. So you only have to worry about the factor of one over a cube b cube. And it's not exactly, it might not be obvious why this is helpful right now, but I'll tell you, it'll make a lot of calculations much simpler. For this, I'm just gonna go ahead and dive right into a problem and you'll see where all of these tricks come into play. Also, I, I do say this a lot that when you're complex fashion, you don't need a diagram. But diagrams can be helpful. 
even if it's not like a perfect complex ruler diagram, you should draw at least a rough sketch so you know where the points are, where everything goes. You have a general idea of what the problem is. So the first problem we're going to do is from China Southeast MO. The source is 2011 problem four. So you have a triangle ABC, circle center O. Now what do you have? A line through O, and the intersect AB, AC, at M and N. E is midpoint and then and or sorry MC and this is in the handout by the way it's the first walkthrough F is midpoint and B and what else is there you want to prove angle F O E equals angle B A C all right so why does this look easy to accomplish? Well, let's think about this, right? ABC circumcenter O. So we're going to set this to be the unit circle, right? These are three points of the unit circle. A line through the origin is somewhat nice, right? Like most lines through the origin are just of the form KZ, where K is a real number. However, it's going to be a bit hard to deal with this. We'll talk about how we're going to deal with the lines in a second. Midpoints are pretty nice, right? Midpoint is just the average of the two points. So E is just going to be M plus C over 2. F is going to be M plus C over 2. Really nice. And the angle condition, it might be a bit hard to work with, but it's not going to be too ugly. We can still do it. So once again, how are we going to talk about this line? This line is something important. So I'm going to go ahead and underline this. So can anyone tell me a really nice line? In the compass plane. Euler line? No, in the compass plane. Euler line is very nice, but mm -hmm. MN doesn't have to be the Euler line. What's an, if I draw this, what, this is a compass plane, right? And we put like ABC here, some triangle. What is a really nice line that you know a lot of properties about? A uh, real axis. Perfect. So we're going to set MN to be the real axis. And why is this going to be nice? Well, MN being the real axis means that we can interest, we can use complex intersection with the point one and negative one, right? Because this line defines the real axis. So we can find M and N using the complex intersection formula. What it also means is that these points are now, we don't have to find some algebraic relationship between M and N, right? The fact that M, N, and O are collinear is already written down in here, right? This fact is already written down because you know what M and N are. This makes it much easier when you're executing the complex bash because otherwise, if M, N is an arbitrary line, you can probably say M, N bar equals N bar, or say M bar N. This is, a, this is collinearity with um, M, N, and O. And you could probably use this and you could complex batch it, but it's easier if you said this to be the real axis. So another tip I did forget to mention is symmetry. And this is saying, all right, if we look at this problem, E and F are the same thing, but you switch B and C, right? So we only have to calculate E and F comes automatically. So we don't actually have to do any of the math for that. So let's go ahead and let's see what M and N are. So I'm only going to calculate M and E, and F, we're just going to switch B and C, and we're going to solve that. So M happens to be, well, let's calculate. M is the intersection of A, B, right? So this is A, B, and the line from 1 and negative 1. So let's go ahead and plug them into this formula for U all the way back here. Compass intersection down here. A, B, 1 plus negative 1. 
first one time like the one of a plus b entire thing divided by a b minus one times negative one now what does it simplify to well the numerator simplifies to two a b plus or sorry minus a minus b well you know not two a b zero a b there we go it's the plus two minus a minus b minus and this should be it's a minus db, right? So, this should be a minus here. So, it's a plus b over a plus one. Does this make sense to everyone how we got what m is? Yes. So now E is just the midpoint of MC, right? So if we calculate E, it's A plus B over AB plus one plus B and try to think divided by two. This is A plus B plus C plus two ABC over two times AB plus one, right? So now what is F going to be? Well, we said F comes by switching E, or sorry, B and C. So F is going to be a plus b plus c plus 2abc over 2 times ac plus 1. So does it make sense how we got e and f? Right. If it does, then the rest of our calculation should be pretty simple, right? We just have to show that, well, what, what are we asked to show? foe equals bac. Well, angle foe equals bac if we draw a diagram this is when drawing the diagram becomes apparent right we need to know if the angle is directed or not because in complex numbers equal angles means directed angle in particular i'm going to draw the triangle a b c let's say this is a circle center and then and we're going to draw a midpoint Pretend that this is on the line here. All right. And midpoints go here and here. So FOE, although it doesn't look equal in the diagram, FOE and BAC are in the same order, right? So we can say direct the angle FOE equals direct the angle BAC. This is what we're trying to prove. So let's go ahead and prove that. So F minus O over E minus O. Well, O is zero. So this becomes F over E. And F over E, if you look at it, the numerators are the same. So it's just the ratio of the denominator. So it happens to be two times AB plus one over two times AC plus one, which is just AB plus one over AC plus one. Now, we, what this is equal to, I forgot to write this down, is F over O, F minus over E minus O over B minus A over C minus A is a real number. Or this is equal to its conjugate. Well, before we go ahead and calculate, uh, before we go ahead and expand everything out, which obviously we can do, let's go ahead and look at what happens to each of these expressions when they get conjugated? A B plus one, the conjugate of this is one plus one over A B, A B plus one over A B. So if A B plus one is B, so the conjugate of F minus O over E minus O is equal to, well, the conjugate of the numerator is A B plus one over A B. The conjugate of the denominator is going to be AC plus one over AC. So it's F, F minus O over E minus O, which is just these terms, times, now you have this times, and you have the C over B. So when we're trying to prove this thing is a real number, right? We're trying to prove that F minus O over E minus O times B minus A over C minus A is equal to this. Oh, where did that C by B in green come from? I'll explain this. Give me one second. 
So we're trying to we're trying to show this, right? So if we can find an algebraic relationship between these two and one between these two, we can just simply uh, multiply that term out. So that's what we're doing. How did the C over B come? Well, let's take a look at F. Let me let me write out an additional term. So why is it telling us? So this is equal to, well, AB plus one over AC plus one times AC over AB, right? This is just separating the fraction up. A's cancel. This is going to be equal to our number of problems here. These two are equal. So it's F minus O times E minus O times C over B. Does that make sense? Yes. Cool. So let's see. So now we have a relationship between F minus O over E minus O and this conjugate. And we're going to look for a similar relationship between B minus A over C minus A and its conjugate. Well, B minus A over C minus A, well, the conjugate of this, right, is going to be 1 over B minus 1 over A over 1 minus C minus 1 over A, which is B minus A over AB over C minus A over AC, which is B minus A over C minus A times C over B. Does this make sense? So since I'm going to go to a new page, so this equation here is going to rewrite into F minus O over E minus O over its conjugate. And we need this to be equal to B minus A over C minus A over its conjugate. But we already calculated that F minus O over E minus O is equal to, um, or this thing, we already calculated these two relationships here, right? So let me highlight them. We calculated this relationship over here. And we calculated this one down here. So if we combine them, what do we get? Well, F minus O over E minus O over, well, this is equal to F minus O over E minus O times C over B is equal to B minus A over C minus A over B minus A over C minus A times C over B. So everything cancels out and you just get B over C equals B over C, which is true. So going back, you will get that this equation must have been true. Does that make sense? Yep. So what can we learn from this problem, right? First thing is if we happen to expand stuff, right? Uh, there's not, oops. I do not mean to do this. Give me a second, go back. All right, sorry about that. If we happen to expand stuff, right? There's not much to expand here, but I don't know. We'll see in another problem. That if we do a bad stuff, things can get pretty ugly. I guess if you try to just directly do the division or do this over B minus A, uh, if you directly did F minus O over E minus O over B minus A over C minus A, and you said this is equal to what do we say? A plus one over A C plus one times C minus A over B minus A. And you expanded this entire thing out and took its conjugate and found they were equal. I mean, yes, that does work, but it's much uglier because you're expanding things out. Keeping things factored is really nice. What else did we learn? Um, the choice of line and then the takeaway. Line and then was important, right? If we didn't choose line MN, we'd be stuck with, like we have to somehow relate M and N algebraically. Because obviously if I take two random points MN, find the midpoint and find the angle with O, the angle is not gonna be equal to BAC. It's gonna be equal to something random. So we have to use the algebraic relationship somehow. But by forcing it to, by forcing M and N to be related from the start, it makes it mess. So in general, this, is largely thought of that in terms of what we call degrees of freedom. 
So the problem can give us a bunch of degrees of freedom, and we're going to try to count how many they are and how many we're using. So a degree of freedom is where a point can be, right? So in our problem, what do we have? We have A, B, and C. These are all these are three degrees of freedom, and we have a fourth degree of freedom, which is the point that the line M N lines in, right? The line M N can be any line. So when we're setting our unit circle, we're using two degrees of freedom, right? Because we can still rotate the triangle however we want. So in particular, if I set like A B C up like this. And I'm going to rotate it by like 50 degrees to some ABC that looks like this. As long as like the, the angles are the same, the problem still remains the same. The computation still remains the same. However, sometimes you can find a nice rotation such that this point lies on the real axis, right? Something like this. Or something nice happens. Like in this case, our line MN becomes nice. So, this is really useful when you count the degrees of freedom. If you ever want to rotate your unit circle, it's useful. This is probably easier in complex basket synthetic. I actually forget the synthetic solution to this. Um, I'll think of it and let you know if I remember this. I don't think it was really that bad. You just draw it with the quadrilateral and you win. But yeah, in, in general, when you're bashing, one of the easiest things is midpoint because the midpoint just happens to be like right there. All right, are there any questions for me or about this problem? Are there any more uh, if we have taken like M1 as a random line, not the axis, would it still be this nice or it will be like messy? It will, okay, so let me explain what happened. So you have F, oh, F minus over E minus O, right? F minus O over E minus O, but this is still F over E. F is going to be M plus C over two over um, N plus B over two, which is M plus C over N plus C. Now the thing is the only, the algebraic relationship you have between M and N is that M times N bar equals N times M bar. So you're going to have to somehow take the conjugates. You're going to have to set them equal and you're somehow going to have to be able to equate them, right? So this is when you have to expand. You'd say uh, over, what is it? B minus A over C minus A. You take this, you're going to have to expand it, and then you're going to have to substitute this thing in so that you can cancel stuff out. And if you cancel enough stuff out, it should turn out to be a real number equal to the conjugate. So it, I'm not saying it's not doable. It's most definitely doable but it's harder in general. Uh, also, how did you get this mn conjugate equal to mm conjugate thingy? That's a good question. So this but comes from collinearity. collinearity. It's just collinearity. Yeah, yeah okay, got it. That's what I was saying. When you have um, the, the unit, uh, sorry, uh, when you have the origin, things become really nice. Um, because as you can see, uh, the collinearity condition, it becomes, this thing over here. In general, you'll see, I don't know if I have an example with the origin, but let me check real quick. No, that's not origin. I don't have one with the origin, but if you ever, there are a few problems out there that you can use the origin as one of your points. And when you use the origin as one of your points, it becomes much easier to do. Um, in that case, like when we use one point as origin, can we do like, let's say uh, ABC is a triangle and we use A as origin. We can take B and C uh, on our unit circle, right? You can take B and C on a unit circle. However, the thing is that when A is also in the unit circle, it adds a bit more symmetry to the problem. And it also makes stuff nice, right? Now the issue with uh, A not being on the unit circle is that the circumcenter is not nice, which means the orthocenter is not nice the in center is not going to be as easy as before. Um, basically, a lot of your triangle centers get messed up. So if you have a problem with the large triangle centers, it's generally better to use, or in general, it's easier to use A, B, and C on the uh, unit circle than A on the origin. There are cases where you want A on the origin, 
um, I'll send the other handout I have, in which you'll see one of the problems is you sent one point to be the origin, one point to be one, and the rest of the problem is just compass dashable. Uh, and as for the synthetic solution, I think it goes something like this. You take this point here, D, the midpoint of MN, you draw the circle, these four points, O, S, E, D, are going to be separate. And that should be enough to prove it. So yeah, the proof is much harder, right? Compass numbers is much nicer. You don't have to draw in any random midpoint. You don't have to find any super quadrilateral. You just go ahead and dash. All right, let's go ahead to the next problem, which is Elmo shortlist 2018 D4 employees. So let me just quickly write down the problem. A, B, C, D, E, F, six with hexagon, circum circle, omega. Um, triangle A, C, E, B, D, F, same fourth percentage. What else do we have? X is BD cap CF. Uh, oh no, BD cap CE. Oh, this phrasing is weird. Y is equal to DF cap CE. And you want to show that uh, this circum circle of DXY and perpendicular to CE through A, these three share points. All right, so why would we use compass numbers in the first place? Well, let's take a look. Omega is a circle. So we can set A, B, C, D, E, F all to be points on this unit circle. Now, A, C, E, and B, D, F have the same order center. The formula for order center is nice. A plus C plus E. And this is equal to B plus C plus F. So this is pretty simple. And yes, it, you might be thinking, okay, maybe we have to use something that simplifies. But this is pretty simple for relationship. I think it should be good enough. Um, how do you know if a relationship is good enough? Well, you can think, is there any way to rotate this hexagon such that this relationship always is going to fold? The answer in this case is no. Because no matter how you rotate the hexagon, if the ortho centers are not the same before rotation, they're not going to be the same after rotation. So saying something nice to be a good line doesn't help. Like you can set the Euler line if you want it to be the real axis, but it's not going to give you anything substantial. So we're just going to keep this in mind. Now we know the formulas for complex intersections, so we can find x and y. But the issue is circles. We don't have any formula for circles. But we do have the formula for um, cyclic stuff, right? We can show something is cyclic pretty easily. So, we oh, can also, do uh, like when we are doing computations, suppose we haven't set a real axis yet. And say while mm -hmm. computing, uh, we can just say that there are a lot of A's. And then can we just assume that A lies on the real axis and since it lies on the unit circle, we can just take it to be one because everything is just rotation. Yeah. So if you want, if you obviously this assumes that you haven't assumed, like let's say another point equals one, right? But if you haven't done any assumption other than the unit circle, you can always in the middle of the complex flash, you can always rotate, right? This is equivalent to like in geometry, you're gonna say, now we like you you prove a small lemma. And then you say, we go, we're going to invert, right? Or we're going to take the spiral similarity. Yeah. Think of it like that. You're just taking the rotation to make stuff simple. It's the same thing, basically. Yeah, OK, it makes sense. So you can, you can say wherever you want. Um, so now, what do we have? We can find the perpendicular also pretty easily, right? Um, or not the perpendicular, but we can find the intersection of this the let me draw, draw a different color we're gonna find the intersection of the first and third figures pretty easily i'll explain how in a second and we can use our cyclic condition to finish it off 
So how do we find this perpendicular point? Well, this is where we start to use a bit of the synthetic observations that I think will work. So in triangle ACE, if I'm drawing this perpendicular, right? And this is the point P. P is actually the reflection of the order center over the line CE, right? So the order center is A plus B plus E. So what's P going to be? P is going to be, well, by form for reflection, C plus E minus C E H bar. Now the C plus E minus C E times H bar is just going to be one over A plus one over E plus one over C. Now, this is best to C plus C minus C E over A minus C minus E. So this just happens to be minus C E over A. Does that make sense? Oh, can you tell again how it's will be defined? It's like the intersection of A H cap circumcircle, right? P is A H cap circumcircle, right? Which is also reflection of A H over C E. Yes. And that's how we do it. Obviously, if you wanted, you could find um, P by saying P lies on AH and it has magnitude one, and you could do that. Obviously, it's much less nice than just using reflection. So the reflection doesn't actually make the problem like easier to solve, but it makes it quicker, right? Now you have really nice formula that comes from like four lines rather than like 10 or 15 lines of complex back. So uh, while it is a back, yeah, go ahead. Uh, why did we define P here? Like, so, so P, we're trying to show that these three points, these three things pass through one point, right? This so problem this point P. This is the problem. Show that these three things pass through one point. This, the circumcircle of, let me draw a diagram. So this is what you have, right? Um, A, C, E, D, D, F. B, D, F, all right, like this. And then you're taking B, D, and D, F with C, E, so this is X, Y. And you're trying to show that the circle, the circle circle, and this perpendicular line all intersect at one point. This is what the problem is asking to show. Does that make sense? Ah, I see. So like it obviously. So this is our point P. So we're going to say P is the intersection of the perpendicular and the circle circle. And we're going to show P lies on DX1 because we know nothing about DX1, right? Yeah, all right. So we calculated P is equal to minus CE over X, which is really nice, really simple, right? It's very small, easy to work with. Now we have to compute X and Y. Now, I'll just compute X and Y. We can replace B with F. Remember, that's the thing we can do. So X is going to be, well, by complex intersection, I'm just going to write out the formula, minus C, E, C plus D over B, D minus C. All right, so now obviously we could probably I don't know, we could probably solve it with X here and Y being equal to the, whatever the symmetric value is, right? When you switch B and F, but this looks kind of ugly, right? This is like your BDC, BDE, and none of these terms will actually cancel out, which is probably pretty annoying. However, if you remember something I did mention when we were talking, here you go. Uh, I think I did mention that the conjugate of this term here is going to be nicer than the actual term. The conjugate happens to be, where did I write it down? Here we go. This is the conjugate, right? The conjugate happens to be much nicer because the terms are much simpler than the numerator. The denominator is the same. So let's go ahead and try to use that. 
So this is a trick that you can use. Also, this conjugate is when points lie on that uh, unit circle, right? Uh, sorry, could you repeat that? Yeah, uh, all the a, yeah, all the points have to lie on the unit circle. Yeah. yeah okay. One one thing don't like the unit circle. In general, things are either really messy or they're just um impossible. Like, or not impossible, but like really, really hard to derive, and you might be doing something wrong. So this is obviously, I'm just gonna say if you wanted, you could take x and y and you can solve it with whatever x and y you have, right? It's gonna be like maybe. I don't know. From here, it's going to be maybe 15 minutes. You have to be careful, right? Not to mess up. But it's not going to be impossible. It's definitely going to be possible. However, we can show, instead of showing that D, P, X, Y is cyclic, right? We can show that D bar, P bar, X bar, Y bar are cyclic. Does that make sense? Yeah, because they are just a reflection over a line, right? So they're still the same. Right. And this is going to be much easier. Why? Well, first of all, D is just one over D. P is just one over P. Now, X bar and Y bar happen to be simpler. So this is a trick that happens to be pretty common. Uh, sometimes taking the reflection and working with conjugates is easier than working with the real numbers because sometimes the conjugates happen to be negative. So what's X bar? Well, if we use the formula that I mentioned before, or you just derive this from what we have here, CD minus CE. So how can we simplify this? Well, if you did notice, we do have one condition, which is our orthocenter right here. So if you look at this, B plus D minus C minus E happens to be, this happens to be F minus A, right? So this makes it even simpler, which tells us we must be doing something right because we keep on getting simpler expressions to work with. So, so we can just D remove C A to get term in A and P because we'll be dealing with that in the right? Yeah, you can you can remove uh you can remove one of the terms if you want it. I'm just gonna leave it like this. Um oh. the reason is because well you can leave it like this, you can leave it like this at this point. Um, I know how much calculation it takes because originally I didn't I did not notice this trick, but the calculation is not going to be bad either way. The calculation is still going to be pretty easy, no matter which way you do it. So even if you didn't notice right now, it's still doable. So um, it's it's going to take roughly the same time. It might take like maybe a few more minutes, but not like fifteen or twenty minutes more. So what does consecutivity mean? What does this thing consecutivity mean? Well, it means x minus d over x minus r over x this is equal to same thing. Oh, uh, what's r? I oh, sorry, p p p. I used r in my hand now, which is what I was about. So there we go. So if we can show this right, this is just angle, right? So if we can show this, we're done. But now here's where I say the word symmetry is so useful. X and Y are just like you switch uh, B with F. So in any formula for X, for any computation that relates to X, if you switch B and F, you get the same thing that relates to Y. And D and P don't determine, sorry, uh, D and P don't determine or aren't like dependent on B and F. Like D is just a random point and P is just, uh, what is it? Negative C E over A that does not have a B or F. So we only need to show that this expression does not depend on either B or F or where, when it depends, you can switch them, right? So if the equation or if the thing is the same, if you switch B and F, then you're fine. So, what can we do? Well, let's calculate something. What is x bar minus d bar? x bar minus d bar, well, this happens to be, let's see, minus d bar is just one over d. 
So this is when you think, can I simplify it? Can I make this simpler to you? And you realize, no, right? There's no way to keep this really simple. So you're going to hope when you do the subtraction, things will factor or cancel out. So let's do this. It's uh, BD, BD would cancel out, right? BD would cancel out. That's correct. And it also happens to factor. My All right, C. makes sense. So this is, this is D minus C into D minus C, right? Yeah, we'll, we'll see what it exactly is. Yeah, that's exactly what it is. B D minus C E. And this simplifies into D square minus C D minus uh, E D plus C E. And this is going to be um, D minus C, D minus E over B D minus C. So this, the fact that it comes out so nice, right? The fact we left with this tells you we did something right. Because it ha if it's so nice, something oh, must. One thing you know, missed right. a one by D in the denominator. Oh, yeah, yeah. One by D. There's a D in the denominator. That's a good point. Thank you for catching that. But yeah, if it's so nice, something has to have gone right. If it's ugly, maybe something's wrong, maybe it's right. But this form is so easy to work with, right? It's factored. The denominator is not bad. The numerator is not bad. So what else can we do? Well, we have to calculate x minus p, x bar minus p bar. So this is d minus e minus e over b d minus c e minus c e over a. Now, if you did this, you well, notice c that e minus a is conjugate, is p, right? We need p conjugate. Oh, sorry, p conjugate is a over c. My bad. Thank you oh, for okay. that. Yeah. Because A, C, E, the conjugates of each of them is just one over that. The so yeah. P conjugate is negative uh, A over C. So it's going to be plus. So now, I'm not going to do this, but if you do this calculation immediately just by hand, you notice that nothing cancels out. But do we notice that we have this second expression over here. This is actually going to come useful right now. Because if we try to use that, we get F minus A over BD minus CE plus A over CE. And this is going to be equal to, let's see. Um, oh, so ACE cancels out. Correct. You'll be just a FCE plus ABD. Right? Or oh, plus ABD, right? not minus ABD. Uh, plus ABD, yes, minus. Uh, is this and minus ACE. Give me one second. I am. Oh, I think that should be a minus f because a plus c plus e equal to b plus d plus f, not f minus a x conjugate. Oh yeah, sorry, that's that's what I mean. There we go. There we go. It should be a minus. Now that makes sense. There we go. That's why it's in wrong. This is a minus f over this, and that that's when things will cancel out. So you get this to be ACE minus BDF. So this happens to be, is there a common term? No, this should be CEF. This is ABD minus CEF over BD. Oh, times BD minus C. I can't forget that. Oh, wait, what am I doing? What is C? My bad. There we go. So we have this, right? We have these two formulas here. So we need to show that when you divide them and then divide by their conjugate, it's symmetric in D or B and F, right? So we need to show that X minus D over X bar minus D bar, you divide this entire thing by X minus P over X bar minus P bar is symmetric in B and F. 
Now, obviously, if you try to expand or multiply or whatever, it's going to be like a huge pain. So let's do that same trick with stuff that conjugates to almost itself. What happens if we just compute x minus c over x bar minus c bar? So we're going to take the conjugate of the conjugate of x minus c, which we all know this is going to be x minus c, right? But we know that conjugate of x minus c is equal to this. Here we go. So now let's go, if you go ahead and take the conjugate, right? It's one over d minus one over c times one over d minus one over e over one over e times one over b d minus one over c e, right? And what do we get? Well, this is equal to d minus c times d minus e, and the denominator here is d c d square e over on the bottom is just going to be b d minus c e. The denominator is going to be what? B, C, D, E squared, something like this, right? And if you cancel, what do we get? B, C, D, this cancels to be D, this cancels to be B, E. So you're going uh, to get something I, like I this. I have one doubt. Mm -hmm. uh, why are you doing like X minus D equal to X minus D double conjugate instead of just taking X minus D directly? So we know we do, we calculate it over here. We calculate this value, which is X minus D conjugate, right? Yeah. So if you take the conjugate of that, you get the original number, right? Does that make sense? Yeah, that's fine. But like, why not just do it directly? Uh, we, we already know the conjugate. So that's what we're doing. We're just taking the conjugate of that again. Uh, I see. So we need to find X minus D. We have X bar by like let's say we have a complex number z and we already have its conjugate so to find the complex original complex number we can take the conjugate of the conjugate again and that that's what we want so this is almost a formula for x bar or x bar minus d bar right this is uh x bar minus d bar times now there's a uh, how much are we off by? It happens we're off by like b e square over d, something like this, right? Now, what about the other one, x minus p? We do the same thing, right? x minus p is the conjugate of this expression down here. Oops. This expression down here. Let's see. a b d minus c e f over c e. D minus C. So now, what is this equal to? Um, it's one over ABD minus one over CEF over one over CE times one over BD minus one over CE. Give me one second. Let me change. Oh, no, 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 no. So this happens to be what? ABD minus CEF over. A, B, C, D, E, F over uh, B, D minus C, E. And this is divided by B, C squared, D, E squared. So now if we cancel, right, this becomes A, well, the B, B C, D, E cancels as A, F, and the denominator becomes C, E. So this is equal to x bar minus p bar, right? This because the first part is almost x bar minus p bar times c square e square over a f. So now this is where we're almost done, right? We just need to show that the division, this is symmetric. So this division is equal to well x minus d over x bar minus d bar is b e square over d, and now I'm dividing that by this thing. E squared E squared over F or AF, right? And really, what is this going to be equal to? 
you just cross multiply it. A F B E square over D C squared E squared. And now this thing is symmetric in B and F, right? So if I switch B and F, it's the exact same value. So this is going to be symmetric. So we're done. Does that make sense to everyone? Yeah. Also, this is quite clean, I think. This is quite clean because you just, this is why I say exploit symmetry. Instead of trying to, because obviously, if you wanted to, you could find y minus b and y minus c and multiply, right? But if you're only looking for symmetric stuff, then things become really, really simple. So what uh, are the also, takeaways? How do you get the idea of taking x minus d equals conjugate of conjugate of x minus d? So you already have, so how do you get this idea? Good question. So you already have some number, right? Some number, let's say conjugate z, and you need to find the original value of z. So let's think of this in terms of a plus bi. Conjugate of z is equal to a minus bi, right? So, and z is equal to a plus bi. So if you want to go from here to here, you just take the conjugate because it switches the minus into a plus. Alternatively, if you didn't notice that, what you could do is you can show, I did mention that we could also show that these four points are cyclic, right? What I did here, this is the condition for x, d, p, y cyclic. But this, this I could show instead by saying d bar minus x bar over uh, uh, p bar minus x bar over the conjugate of this. So the conjugate of d bar minus x bar over p bar minus x bar. And you want to show this is symmetric instead. Because it shows these four points are symmetric. And this is just a reflection over the real axis. Does that make sense? Yes. And this happens to be, by algebra, it happens to be this. So it's the exact same thing that we did. But in case you didn't notice, that's what happened. So the primary takeaway is look to factors, right? We try to factor stuff, it works. We or um, simplify, right? You want things to cancel. If things, if terms go away, it makes your life easier. Also, rotate or reflect how. In this case, we reflect, right? Or quote unquote reflect it over the real axis. Even though we don't know what the real axis is, right? If we drew the uh, problem synthetically, right? If I go to my diagram here, the real axis could be any line. The real axis could be this line here, right? We don't know what the real axis is. But whatever it is, if we reflect over it, our computation is much simpler. So any algebraic transformation- So I think maybe uh, taking BF as uh, the real axis would help even more because then you BF just have- yeah. See, here's the issue with BF as the real axis. If you took BF as the real axis, then you're going to have the issue of um, BF is not necessarily a diameter of the circle, right? If you knew BF was a diameter, you could take it as the real axis. All right. But I see. if you don't know that, the reason we need A, B, C, D, E, F to be on the unit circle is because P becomes nice and X becomes somewhat nice, and so does one. If BF is a uh, random point on the real axis, you don't have that. You could probably do something with BF being parallel to the real axis. That could help. But once again, um, it's just, it, it obviously it could help, but it's just a bit complicated because you get this weird relationship. In general, if you can't think of like an automatic way to do it, it's sometimes just helpful to start writing out computations and if you see something that makes it simpler, right? Let's say we got a lot of terms with where you just multiply by B, setting B equals one or something like that would make stuff cancel out. So if you, I always suggest to start writing computations out and what you think is most helpful is always a good thing. These are our two takeaways, pretty important. Um, in general, you can apply any transformation, right? So you can multiply all the complex numbers by some number. You can add to them. You could conjugate, you can invert, you can do anything. As long as like the problem statement stays the same, right? Like four points are sticky. 
means they're still thick. So if you think of it, like you sometimes have to think of it in synthetic to make sure that you're not changing what the problem is. But as long as you're making sure that you haven't changed the problem and the problem is easier to work with, go ahead and continue your batch. All right, are there any questions for this problem? This was a nice one. I really like it. This is a nice problem. I'm going to go over one last problem really quick. Let's see how quick we can do. This is also from Elmo. As you can tell, Elmo has a lot of complex batch problems. Um, do you have triangle ABC for the center H? And this is a nice problem. Also, can you give me like uh, two, three minutes yeah. to try it? Yeah, I'll give you a few minutes to try it. P, comma, Q. Line one circle diameter gauge. Actually, there's a uh, the, I'm actually going to ask you a few questions instead of having you just try it. Uh, and M lies on PQ for the center. All right, here you go. So I'll draw a quick diagram. Somewhat accurate. Oh, P and Q are random points, right? Oh, MPQ on the circle. Yeah. yeah. But you need you need M, the midpoint of BC, to line on the line PQ. So, oh, I think this one was also in config geo. Yes, it's most likely going to be in conflict geo because all the center conflicts are pretty rich, pretty popular. But this is pretty bad at the circle, but it's complex bashing. You don't have to draw an accurate diagram. That's a neat thing. And the word the center is going to be this one here. All right. So while you're starting, so we're going to try, obviously, this is a complex bash test. You can do this synthetically as with all geo problems that have been proposed to form any practice. But let's look at it from a complex batch perspective. So what, how are we going to set up? Let's take care of the setup. Which, what, what do you think we're going to do? What circle do we want as a unit circle? Does anyone have an idea? Uh, like, if, as usual, if we try to set up ABC as the unit circle, then the issue is like ortho center of AQP, which we need, won't be A plus Q plus V. So that's, that's not correct. Right. So yeah, but what do you uh, think? Also, yeah, if you set ABC as a unit circle, then we know circumcenter of uh, that circle APQ, which is just midpoint of AH, which is nice. And then you mentioned the relation that ortho center minus two times circumcenter is just A plus P plus Q. So I think we can use that then. So you're, you're onto something, that's correct. But once again, you didn't mention that the ortho center is so you can obviously do it that way. I actually, I'm just going to be completely honest. I I didn't actually think of that. So that's pretty clever. And yes, that that would definitely work. Now, what if I'm just going to throw this out here? What if you try to do the same thing, but set APQ to be the unit circle? Now, why am I going to say APQ as the unit circle? Well, can you define all the points in terms of that circle? Let's see. So we know APQ, right? H is obviously going to be the A antipode, right? It's just going to be, so this is A, this is P, that's Q. H is equal to negative A, right? Uh, APQ, you know, circle. Uh, shouldn't H be one by A, like conjugate of A? 
uh, conjugate of A is a reflection over the real axis. This right. is a reflection over O. So this is negative. Okay. Um, it's not very clear because my diagram is kind of bad, but the center of the circle is here. So I'm going to call the center O. All right. Or oh, sorry, let's call the center N. There's a reason. So now, okay, so I said we're going to choose AP as a unit circle. Now, if AP is a unit circle, and I'm just going to draw the circle center in here somewhere, let's say the circle center like of ABT. So that's the circle center of ABT. Oh. All right, so we need this point here to lie on the circle. So let's call oh, this point. Can you repeat which point to lie on the circle? We need this point here, the orbit center, I'm going to call J. We need J to lie in the circle circle, right? Oh, okay. So how can we do that? Let's say we're taking APQ as a reference circle. So how can we do that? Well, obviously we could try to find the conspicuous condition, right? But does anything, anyone know anything about the line OM and the line AH? Can someone tell me the relationship between them? They're like parallel. AH is twice of OM. There we go. That's perfect. AH is twice of OM and they're parallel. So in particular, this thing over here is a parallelogram, right? N H M O. Yeah. And this is going to be very useful. Why is this going to be useful? Well, it's N H. M, sorry, if NHMO, it, wait, one second. Okay, never mind. And so if NHMO is uh, something nice, then we can just say O is equal to N plus M minus H, which is N plus M plus A. So what does this mean? If O, if J is on the circle, that means the distance from O to A is the same as the distance from H to J. Right? So we want O minus A equals O minus J. Now, O minus A, we can already see this as M plus N. So we need to find O minus J. O minus J happens to be, well, J is A plus P plus Q. So O minus J is going to be, uh, well, M plus N minus P minus Q. So we need to calculate, well, N is actually zero. So this boils down to showing m is equal to m minus p minus q. Does this make sense to everyone so far? Yes. All right. So now, here's the issue. We don't know anything about b and c, right? But we do know that this circle, it has diameter a. So it passes through some nice points, right? These perpendicular. I'm going to call them e and f. Does anyone know a relationship between M, E, F, and that circle? Uh, M and M F are tangents. So like M oh, yes. and M tangents. This tangency is very important. So remember how I said synthetic observations are very important? This is where they come in use. Because now you can relate the problem with this. For example, yesterday, I'll give you a true story. I was trying to calm this passage one problem, right? So I kept on making synthetic observations, right? I eventually solved it with complex questions. And then someone told me that my complex batch was actually completely synthetic. Basically, if you make enough synthetic observations through complex batch, you can actually sometimes solve the problem synthetically. This, this route won't solve it synthetically, but it's pretty nice. So M, let's call this E and F, right? So M is the intersection of two tangents. Two tangents have the formula 2EF over E plus F. This is the formula for two tangents. Um, if you want a derivation, the simplest one I can think of is the following. You have the unit circle, right? Uh, a, B. And you draw the tangents. This point is going to be the inverse of the midpoint here. The midpoint is A plus B over 2. This point is going to be its inverse, which is 1 over A plus 1 over B. Uh, two, two over, sorry, it's two over A plus B conjugate. This is a formula for inversion. It's, the inversion is a map that sends X to one over X squared. 
So this is going to be like 2AB over HB. A very simple way of deriving the formula for the two tangents. But either way, however you derive it, if you don't want to use it, uh, Evan probably has the derivation in Egmo or in Panda. Now we have this formula, 2EF over E plus F. So this is going to be, M is going to be 2EF over E plus F, which is equal to, well, magnitude of E and F are one. So this is two over E plus F. Now here's the other issue we run into, M minus P minus Q, right? It's probably going to be ugly, but is there some information in the problem that we haven't used? Oh, by the way, uh, how is conjugate of 2EF by E plus F equal to conjugate of 2 by E plus F? Uh, it's not. Basically, the formula for inversion is you take you take the reciprocal and take the conjugate, right? So yes. if I have, you agree that this midpoint here is the inverse of the, uh, the intersection of the tangents, right? Yeah. So basically, the, if you apply the formula for inversion, and you do the calculation, you will get this. This has to be the There's probably a different derivation that doesn't use inversion, but this is very simple, very nice proof. Like for that, so, you can also like think of it as AA intersection BB. In that, yeah, this is AA. This is this is very true. I forgot this proof. AA intersection BB. Obviously, this does take more computation. I don't like computation, so I like inversion proof. But yeah, it works, right? All these proofs will end up working no matter how you prove it. It's just some will be longer than others. In reality, in a context, I will rederive this using the inversion, but you can rederive it however you want, or you can just memorize it. But is there something that we haven't used in the problem? Because M minus P minus Q still looks ugly. Is there something that we haven't used yet? Oh, uh, M is midpoint. Oh, no. Yeah, use that already. Yes. We use M as mid. We actually got rid of B and T, right? Because B and T yeah. play nothing or no, not useful. We can get rid of that. But oh, B and Q lie easy. on the unit circle. We haven't used that, I think. We haven't used that, but there's no place to use that right now. Let's cross out what we need. A, B, C, or the center A. We use that. M is in point B, C. P and Q lie on the circle. We haven't used that yet. Or the center, or we're trying to prove this. So we're going to cross this out. So we either can use this, or we can use M lies on PQ. So what does M lie on PQ mean? Collinearity, right? Or we can use reflection. So I like to use reflection, because once again, I mentioned the formula simpler. Collinearity also works. Well, reflection only that, works when like Q is the midpoint of PM, right? No, reflection is, I'm saying that the reflection of M over the line PQ is M. Oh, I see, I see. Okay. So, so this is just a shortcut for collinearity when you have two points in the unit circle. I didn't mention all the way back here. Where is this one? I mentioned that it's sometimes easier to use the reflection formula over the collinearity formula when you have unit circle because it's nicer. You don't have to actually do any algebra, right? You directly get a relationship. It's, if you use collinearity, it's actually the exact same thing but it might take you like one or two more steps. I'm just, you know, I'm teaching, so I'm just gonna give you the shortcut. You might, when you're doing complex bash, you might be like, okay, I'm going to uh, use collinearity in this time. That's fine, that's up to you. But here, I just like to show the shortest um, thing. Also, this is not too unnatural. That means you can probably figure this out. So M happens to be, well, on the line PQ. So it's P plus Q minus PQ M bar. So now, what you could do is if you do not see it, right? Right now, if you do not see this relationship right here and you wanted to do something, you could substitute M is equal to 2EF over E plus F and M bar. Can't we just take conjugate, like, or can't we just take modulus directly both sides here? That's exactly what we're going to do. But I'm just saying, if you do not notice, right, you could do okay. this, you could substitute, and you could probably figure out a solution. But Pranav is right. Uh, then still we have like P, Q, E, and F, right? That's just, I guess, more messy. Think, wait, wait, let's, let's take a look. We already calculated N is just 2 over E plus F, right? This is, we calculated. So we need to show what M minus P minus Q is. 
Well, this happens to be minus PQ M bar. Now, let's go ahead and look back at our information. Let's once again go ahead and cross out what we have in Q. What's left? P and Q oh. lie on the circle diameter AH. What does this mean? Is this magnitude oh. P, magnitude Q, one. This is equal to magnitude M bar. Now, magnitude M bar has to be the same thing as magnitude M, right? If you're reflecting over um, the real axis, the distance from the origin does not change, right? So we're done. Because these two are equal. All right. Yes. Uh, yes. Sense? Yes. So this is really small, really nice fact, right? And yes, put out the idea where you can say, we know the circle yes. center, so we can find the orbit center. That also would work. Um, so this is the solution that I found. And it's pretty short, right? And pretty nice. Yeah. Are there any questions? Uh, I had I had a question not related to complex bash. What which one do you like more? Complex or barycentric? So let me explain. So complex numbers I like more in general because complex numbers are easier to work with. Basically, when you have a triangle center, right? If you look at most of the formulas for complex numbers, they're quite simple. So the circumcenter is normally zero. The orthocenter is a plus b plus c, stuff like that, right? But once you get more than one circle, it becomes hard to use complex numbers. Or when you have like a length relationship, right? Or a similar triangle, sometimes it can be harder to use complex numbers. That's when they use barycentric. So I personally use both. Um, I will first try complex numbers before trying very centric. But I do think complex numbers are nicer for smaller problems like the problem we just did. Because this problem should also be approachable with very centric coordinates, but it might be hard. The thing with both of these is that the underlying mechanism, what goes underneath in both cases are vectors, right? So for very centric, you could still say the circumcenter n uh, two times n plus j is equal to a plus c plus c, right? You still have this relationship, and you can still use this, and you can still solve just like in complex numbers as you would using your setup. But it's a different thing that I would first check complex numbers. So both are good, but they're useful. Whichever one you like, just use that. Does that make sense? Yeah. I personally use like almost every time barycentric because before I never understood complex nice. Like I didn't know how to set up nice setups and stuff. But I hope like after this class I can do it. Right. So uh, this is very nice. go ahead and try the problem. I did attach a handout. Um there's also a list of tips and tricks. Also, how you should write your proof is all in the handout. So if you're doing it like on the INMO or maybe even the mouth, if you're writing a proof, you can actually write it properly. Um, the problem should be pretty simple with complex, I think. Um, some of them might require synthetic observation. <laughs> uh, yeah, rip it go. But yeah, I think you should be able to solve at least the first few of the easy problems should just be directly complex, like no need for synthetic observation. Maybe a few later ones need to synthetic observation. But the good practice in here's either a unit circle or here's something, and they're good. Can you do BGW complex? Yes, you can most definitely do BGW complex. Um, all of these problems are doable with the right. Yeah, all these problems are definitely. In fact, I'm sure that Evan might have some problems on this list on BGW complex. Or if he doesn't, there are definitely some problems he should put on complex. Maybe not BGW, but on one of them. Uh, what and, kind of problems in complex? Uh, some of the problems are on my handout. They should go on to um, complex handout. Um, if you do notice, like some of these problems on this handout do get pretty hard. Like there are some 63, there's the GA. Um, and this just shows that like complex numbers are just that powerful because they don't care about like the problem number, they just care about like how can you set it up and how well can you execute it. Um, there's also another handout that I did make that ended up being a bit 
too hard for uh, like this class. Uh, I'm going to send it anyway, because in case you want to use it, it's good. Um, give me a second. Let me find the handout. Uh, it's basically complex numbers, but you're also going to throw in a bunch of synthetic observations. So if you like synthetic geometry, I suggest looking at that at least. Um, let me see if I can find the file. I don't know where it's it. Ah, here we go. So that this is same. The first part is the same, but then it talks about using um synthetic observation or what Evan likes to call hybrid geo, as well as less convex, uh, less conventional complex meshes. So if you like, let's say using spinal similarities or inversions or whatever, go ahead and read the handout. It's pretty good. Uh, this is the wrong version. I'll find the right version and put it up in a few minutes. But are there any questions? Feel free to stick around and ask. Other than that, thank you for coming. Hope you learned something. Thanks a lot for the class. I'll stop the recording now. Thanks for the class. Thank you.